Can anyone guess what uh, this is? A quick guess, please. A rock. Uh, well, actually, this happens to be a piece of coal that was on the Titanic the night it sank. That was April 14th, 1912. There are a lot of interesting stories associated with this piece of coal. One of them which we all know. But I'm here to tell you another story. The story of how this coal came back. Because for those of you who don't know, the Titanic is sitting under 12,000 feet. That's two and a half miles of freezing cold water. That's about three tons per square inch pressure. There is no way a human arm could have picked this up from the floor. So how did this get here? The answer is robotics by robotic arms. That by itself shows the potential that robotics has. But why do we need robots? Aristotle himself once said that our lives would be a lot simpler if a lot of the physical tasks around us would be fulfilled by themselves. And we find that all throughout history, people have attempted in doing that. al Jazari in the late 12th century, made a robot that would serve drinks. He also made a musical robot band and a lot of others. And uh, in the 17th century, Japanese craftsmen made karakuri puppets. These were human-like figures. The most common one is this, where you put a teacup on the robot and it starts moving. That's a tea serving maid. Henri Maillardet uh, made the draftsman writer. This is an automaton that could make four drawings and write three poems. In 1920, the word robot was first used in a Czechoslovakian play called Rossum's Universal Robots. The play is set in the future, or at least what is supposed to be the future back then, the 1960s, a time when robots are spread all around the world. But just like any robotic story, it ends by the robots taking over the world. Okay, so when computer power began to grow, a lot of more sophisticated robots came about. And the most demanded robots today are the industrial robots, and uh, robots are also used in surgeries. Prosthetic arms and limbs are made by um, robotic equipment today. Also, robots are used in places which are harsh for human beings. What you're looking at is the video feed of a robot that was sent inside the Fukushima a nuclear plant after Japan was hit by a tsunami. And uh, we sent robots to Mars. The International Space Station has a robot named the Canid Arm. And this is Dr. Robert Ballard. He was the one who found the wreck of the Titanic. He used a robot to get a glimpse of what the inside of the Titanic looks like after about 70 years of mystery. Now, at this point, I want to tell you a little about myself. You see, as a child, I was always fascinated about robotics. And so I had this, uh, these ideas, and one of them was making this robot. It was supposed to... Uh, walk on land, it had grappling hooks, and not to mention it was supposed to fly. I worked on it for a whole month until finally I gave it up. It was getting nowhere. <laughs> then years later I got this sense of helping other people and help for me meant having a contribution that is significant, that's on a global scale. And so uh, I did that by trying to come up with innovative ideas in the field of robotics. Some of these were remotely operating a robot or using small robots that can reach places we can't. Or how about modeling the environment so that it becomes easier to write algorithms for the robot to operate with. Now, I don't know if you've already realized it, but each and every one of those ideas has already been thought of and it's been around for a while. The first one is called telerobotics, nanorobotics, mapping. 
Now, out of this desperation, I, wa I wanted to create something, in, um, come up with something new. I came up with another idea. How about feeling what the robot feels? That was also thought of. <laughs> it's called haptic interaction. Now, I realized that all throughout, like when I was coming up with ideas, let it be thinking or making something, I was trying to answer the same question which a lot of the roboticists are trying to answer today. And it's been going on for a while. The question is, when will the robots get here? Well, it's a bit misleading if you just put it straight like that, for two reasons. Firstly, after looking at all the robots that I just showed you, wouldn't you agree that we already have robots today? I actually think not, because they're not spread. In any field, a small portion of research is applied way more than the, r the rest of the field put together. And in robotics, that small portion isn't viable yet. The second reason is that this is not the only question that comes to mind when we think of, ro of uh, when the robots are going to get here. There's this element of curiosity to know what it will be like. And so, let's uh, define a robot quickly. Um, Joseph Engelberger, the man considered to be the father of robotics, said that I cannot define a robot, but I know one when I see one. And so, since the type of robot that mo most of us think of uh, is a housemaid, which takes the decisions by itself, um, that, and that's w what's known as an autonomous robot. This is how it usually works. It has sensors to sense the environment and ma manipulators to manipulate the environment. Now, humans are capable of doing these tasks with ease. However, such is not the case in robotics. And one of the main reasons for this is that artificial intelligence has not developed yet. It could take years, decades, centuries. We don't know. Now that is the reason why you and I don't have robots today. However, at this point, I would like to mention another type of robot, which I feel will get here before the autonomous robot, one which is remotely operated by a human operator, the tele-operated robot. So uh, think of it this way. The uh, robot's manipulator control can be classified into two types, the conscious and the subconscious. Now, these terms mean just exactly the same thing what they mean when referred to for humans. The conscious mind makes decisions of when, how, and where to implement the subconscious actions. Now, the subconscious actions have a pattern to them. Uh, because, and that makes it a lot easier to write algorithms for them. Robots have always been good at executing written algorithms. However, making decisions is just not their thing for now. The teleoperated robot's advantage here is the conscious actions and decisions come directly from the human operator. And at this point, if we bring the environment closer to the robot, we have a much more plausible way of implementing um, a, a robot which can be widely spread. So it, now, if we think of this robot as one which is associated with the internet, like the operator uses the internet to control the robot, we have the, a form of online robotics. A better way to explain this is think of the internet uh, as starting off by the webcam, mic, and the, speak and the speakers. These, in a way, give the internet eyes, ears, and a mouth, Robotics will give the internet hands. Now, how will such a system function? I see that there will be two types of people who would use robots. The first are the owners, the people who own the robots, and second are the operators who will operate them. The operators will carry out functions for a fee on the owner's robots, and that's how it will work. Secondly, I feel it should be open to the public in the sense that if some of us have ideas uh, towards uh, online robotics, we should be able to work towards them the same way we work with uh, our own websites. Now, uh, how will we control such a robot? As long as we're just making decisions of when and where to implement the subconscious actions, we won't need any sophisticated form of control. And hence, I feel uh, we can control robots in that way by electronic devices, laptops, Blackberries, or whatever comes out by then. Secondly, uh, there are quite 
a, a number of advantages that such a system ha can offer to the general public. The first one is organization. If you picture a room consistent of a number of objects and all the objects are mapped and have a record on them, which is stored in a database inside the robot, along with the map of the room, it could be possible for that just by a click of a button, you, you, can arrange, you can get your robot to arrange your room. Second advantage is standardization. The way that online robotics helps standardize is that it brings a large number of robots from all around the world on a common platform. So what that would do is that could establish de facto standards, and, and over time, these standards would be accepted as worldwide standards. Thirdly, it would offer new skills, meaning that operating a robot itself becomes a skill. If you think about it, you wouldn't necessarily have to be a very good cook, and yet you can use a robot to do a task which is just of the same quality. And hence, uh, the skill over here is that you are operating a robot rather than you cooking. Fourthly, in the manufacturing industry, there are certain advantages which robotics can pose. There is so much that is dependent on the process of how a product is made. So if we have a software that guides a person who is using an online robot, a worker, through a path and prevents him from taking shortcuts which would affect the quality of the service, then, then what that would do is create a product with a much better quality. Finally, robotics also has a lot of advantage to workers. This is a construction site which I was vi videotaping about two years ago. The way it works is there is a worker who gets on the crane and opens a lever to unload the cement which fills the pillars. Unfortunately, one day, one of the crane malfunctioned and uh, broke while a worker was on it. He was seriously injured and had to be rushed to the hospital. But this actually tells something very interesting about us, that it might be an extreme case, but injuries to workers is not something new. Even when the Titanic was built, it claimed about six lives and injured 250 people. Now, the, the number one advantage which I feel uh, robots can offer workers is that it can make their work safer and healthier. Safer, like you've just seen, healthier by reducing night shifts. Night shifts are, are unnatural and cause a lot of problems to um, hu humans. However, if we have, say, a robot that workers use to operate from different parts of the world as per shift timings, a lot more workers are going to work during the day and sleep at night. Now, is an online robot a good idea or a bad idea? Since the concept is new, it's only natural that we will have such a question, because we're, we're beginning to wonder now, is this going to affect our jobs or, um, and etc.? Well, to answer this, I want to tell you all a story, another story of the Titanic. When the Titanic was discovered, a lot of things happened, such as people used robotic arms to go and rip things off the ship. And it's considered that the ship goes through a lot of damage when that happens. This insight into the Titanic tells something very interesting about what robots can ha offer for the future. A lot is to come from robotics, and not all of it is going to be good. Not all of us are going to be either fans of every single thing that robots do. But we have to keep in mind that robotics is just the means. Man-made machinery has always been the means. The good and the evil comes not from machines, but us. Dr. Robert Ballard believed that the best way of telling the story of the Titanic was to go to it, not bring it to you. And so he had this dream that one day the Titanic would be surrounded by cameras and robots so that everyone around the world could view it globally, more like a, a baseball game. Less than a month from now marks the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. That's when this piece of coal will be taken back to the wreck site of the Titanic and dropped over there, in hopes that one day, if the Titanic is made into an underwater museum, then it will be a part of it. 
And by then, it will have another story to tell. Thank you.